afternoon. My name is Mashiru Masutara Mutle. I would like to welcome you all to the second of six online policy dialogues as part of the Southern Africa Towards Inclusive Economic Development SA Tide program. That's the Research into Policy series. SA Tide is a collaborative research policymaking and capacity building partnership between the National Treasury, UNU Wider, the South African Revenue Service the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Trade and Industry and Compet the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and the European Union. The program also includes a number of local and international universities. So the work of SA Tide has been generously supported by funding from the EU, for which we are very really grateful for the support. Since its inception, the program's goal is improved economic research for informed evidence-based policy to promote inclusive growth in South Africa and in the region. It is a result of a unique collaboration between local and international officials and experts under six work streams, namely enterprise development, public revenue, macro modeling, inequality, climate and energy and regional growth. You are all able to get all the research that's been done over the past three years on the SA Tide website. Today's policy dialogue is hosted under the work stream climate and energy transition as drivers of change. We will seek to address the trade-offs between investing in development based on today's uncertainty about future climate versus investing in the future once the climate change has occurred. So to our audience members, we encourage you to be part of the conversation by writing your questions on the chat box or raise your hand to our, and our guests will be more than happy to respond to any questions that you might have for any of them this afternoon. So we welcome you once again. So to kick things off, we will begin with a synthesis um, of research findings that produced under the work stream of climate change and energy transition as drivers of change by Channing Arndt, Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at IFPRI, and Kenneth Stresspack, he's from MIT. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mashudu. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, here we go. Uh, we can see that. So, and move into presentation mode. So, thank you very much. The topic today is climate related investments now or later. This is all about prioritization. Uh, we can't do everything at all, all at once. So, um, what should we do first and what should we do later? Um, to begin climate change, uh, we, we expect warming, and uh, this is what we tend to expect in Southern Africa. This particular graph is looking at the west side of Southern Africa. All of the graphs, uh, eastern, central, and west are, are, are quite similar. Um, this blue band is sort of the historical range of, of climate. Um, what we have are a number of bins, uh, 0 to 0.5 degree rise in temperature relative to the end of the 20th century and increasing in 0.5 uh, degree increments. We have a series of uh, climate scenarios. One is reference where emissions continue more or less as they are um, right now. A second is um, Paris forever where the current Paris agreement, uh, the, the, the commitments are, are met within that but then no other commitments are made. The Paris commitments are not sufficient to reach a two degree Celsius uh, world. So it, we have a scenario where two degrees Celsius is, is achieved through further commitments and emissions reductions, and then a strong emissions reduction scenario of 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. So if we look at that particular one, 1.5 degrees, then in most instances about the, it, by about 2060, 70% of the time, we have a warming in the range of 0.5 to one degree relative to the end of the 20th century. It's possible that it's only in the zero to 0 0.5 degrees. In other words, the climate stays within the historical range roughly, but it's also possible to be warmer. As we move to greater emission scenarios, we get greater temperature rises even by 2060. So when we go to the strongest emission scenario, the most likely outcome is you know, almost a 45% chance probability is in the 1.5 to two degrees uh, of warming. 
less warming is possible, but also more. So this is in December, January, February for Western Southern, but, but it looks pretty similar um, for, for most of, of these. So there's a consistent warming and the more emissions we get, the more warming comes. When we go to precipitation, we end up with uh, less sign of consistency. Um, here is a similar set of climate scenarios, similar binning, but this time it's precipitation. This is in millimeters per 10 days uh, and probabilities on the, on the left-hand side. So if we just focus on December, January, February, again, the blue line, the blue range is, is historical climate variability. And if you stay at 1.5 degrees Celsius, then most of your outcomes are some mild drying within um, the, the sort of historical range. But as we head to stronger emission scenarios, we get a much, much greater spread of potential outcomes. It could get wetter or it could get drier. The bulk of outcomes push you towards the drier in Western Southern Africa. This is broadly true uh, uh, across the region. And so uh, precipitation with, with temperature, we're, we're confident things will get warmer. In, in precipitation, we're not certain whether uh, the climate will broadly wet or, or broadly dry. And what's happening here is um, uh, uh, can be seen in a little more detail. So these are 18 general circulation models of the earth and atmosphere. And these are the patterns of precipitation change. The red is, is wetting and green is drying. And what we're observing is steep gradients between areas of wetting and areas of drying. So for example, uh, here we have in green uh, a wetting and then in red a drying and, and a very small area in between um, the two. So that actually showing up rather robustly through all of the models. What's not robust at all is where these gradients actually are. And so what happens is in some cases we end up with, for example, substantial drying in this region. But in another model, it's, it's wetting. And so those distributions are reflecting this uncertainty that the models are showing. Um, we also have, you know, we don't live a climate in the sense we live weather and, and climate is what we expect to happen. It's the, the average uh, of, 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 the, of the outcome. So we expect it, you know, in summer to be warm and in winter to be, to be cooler. Uh, but on a given day, we can have warmer days or, or cooler days and wetter days and drier days. So we go ahead and we add weather uh, to, to the climates. We do a, a pretty thorough job of, of dealing with multiple climates and multiple possible weather combinations. And this gives us a, a, a richness in terms of possible outcomes. And with the large number of outcomes, we can look at uh, the ranges of potential outcomes. So here, instead of looking at uh, the region, Western Southern Africa, we're looking at actually South Africa. And this is a box and whisker plot. So, Inside the box is about 75% of, of outcomes. And inside the whiskers, the large majority of outcomes, the dots are uh, outliers or, or extreme outcomes. The blue is, is climate. So this is the variation in the 2020s under the two degree scenario that we expect in climate for, for temperature in South Africa on, on average. But when we add weather, the, the range is, is much, much greater and we can have uh, more extreme uh, events. As we run through time, and especially in the stronger emission scenario, the Paris Forever scenario, we get a widening of the range of possibilities generally and, and much more extreme outcomes in terms of temperature. For South Africa, we get a fairly consistent outcomes in terms of, of precipitation. Distribution is not changing that much and relatively few um, outliers uh, uh, across, but this is not the, the case everywhere in Southern Africa. In Zambia, for example, we find uh, the distributions for precipitation becoming a little wider as, the, um, uh, as, as time and, and emissions pile up under the stronger emission scenarios, and we have much more uh, climate outcomes that are more extreme. So, this is the variation that, that we, are, we are looking at. This variation has a lot of implications for what we should do now and what we should do later. Um, we have a, a fair amount of uncertainty and we need a, a fair amount of resilience and robustness. One of the areas where we've looked uh, in some detail is in terms of agricultural yields. And, uh, and in particular, 
um, the threat of, of extreme events or extreme yield events. So what we're looking at here is a calculation of the 20 year maize yield uh, extreme event. So what we're looking at is the five worst years in, uh, in a century. And we're looking at that across countries and across uh, emission scenarios for the 2040s and for the 2060s. And what we see is if we have strong um, mitigation and we go only to the 2040s, so for South Africa, we see that the the 20 year event becomes more likely instead of happening once every 20 years, it's happening once every 16, 16 or 17 years. And this stays relatively consistent uh, into the 2060s. If we emit more and move to two degrees centigrade, though that 20 year event becomes substantially more likely, but the, the likelihood doesn't change very much over the course of the 2040s into the 2060s. But as we get to greater and greater emissions, then these, uh, what used to be a 20 year event or something that would likely happen once or twice uh, in, in, your light, in, a, in your lifetime uh, or your, your operating lifetime as a farmer um, becomes far more likely. So uh, in the reference scenario, the strongest emission scenario in the 2060s, what is a 20 year event reduces down to about a six or seven year event or, or effectively uh, triples in, in likelihood. So instead of happening uh, once every 20 years, happening about once every seven or the probability is about 15% instead of, of five. So this is one of the um, uh, examples and this is a, a, a nicely done uh, new set of work uh, by Tim Thomas. Um, so this brings us to the question, you know, sort of trying to set things up for the question, what, what do we do now or later? And I just want to feed the discussion a little bit with some thoughts on what we might do now and what we might do later and their characteristics. So one of the things that really it's important to do now is agricultural research. Uh, we, we need, we want to produce food. There's a fair amount of uh, dependence, especially in the region, but also in South Africa on agriculture. Agricultural research has a, a long lag between the investment in research and the ultimate benefit. Uh, so if we want to deal with uh, higher temperatures and you know, more variable rainfall in the 2040s uh, and 2030s and 2040s, then we have to invest uh, now. Um, this comes out of the, the, the graphs. It's certainly in the interest of South and Southern Africa to see uh, mitigation happening uh, through, through time. Um, one of the, in the energy stream that uh, we find that uh, it, it's actually economically an improvement to switch out of coal-fired electricity generation into renewables. So this is something we should, South Africa should be doing over time, independent of climate change, but certainly climate change strongly reinforces the case for action. That's something to start uh, with. Um, one of the things that we found and which very much stays in place in our more recent analyses is that South Africa has a very significant water infrastructure, storage and ability to transfer water between river basins. This is an extremely important asset in dealing with uncertain uh, and potentially more intense uh, rainfall. So maintaining that is, is, is critical and it's an important asset. So that's something we should do now. Things that we might do later or that we would do after careful consideration, uh, large new hydropower investments. If there's drying and warming, then uh, there's less precipitation, meaning less water, more evaporation, meaning less water. And so as a consequence, large new hydropower investments which might not have the water eventually to actually turn the turbines in the way that we expect. So this is something we have to be careful about. Uh, protective infrastructure, is sometimes worthwhile. It might be worthwhile to build a dike to, to prevent um, flooding, but it's it's something even without climate change um, has a checkered history, these, these kinds of investments. And so we do want to be uh, careful. Finally, striving for food self-sufficiency um, is something that, that uh, sort of is, is a reaction to uh, want to, to seeing this increased variability. But in fact, we're gonna see variation in rainfall and temperature conditions, in the, in the quality of growing decisions, not just in Southern Africa, but around the world. And what we want to do is to be able to trade, to be able to bring in product with, for, in areas where, where um, you know, weather has been favorable uh, in order to offset where, where it has not been. So climate change strongly favors open trade. So with that, um, I will pass back 
to uh, Mashudu, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to deliver this introduction. Thank you very much, Channing. Just maybe one question. three or four principles, uh, principle lessons from this program? Well, uh, in, the, in the energy stream, uh, we've done uh, quite a good job, I think, of, of illustrating the, the benefits of shifting to renewables over time. Uh, it's not right straight away, but uh, I think we've done a convincing job of showing that by the 2030s, 2040s, and 2050s, this is, this is an excellent uh, investment. Um, the other um, major item to bring into this climate discussion and debate is this issue of, of variation and variability. Um, it, it was not long ago that you know, people would show up and say, oh, it's going to get drier or, oh, it's going to get wetter. Uh, and in fact, it could get drier or it could get wetter. And, and this has implications for the, the ways that, that you uh, invest. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, implications that I mentioned before was this, this water infrastructure uh, issue and, and keeping that water infrastructure maintained, it already exists and improving it uh, is a, a, a very good deal, uh, one of the best in terms of, of uh, things to do uh, now. Uh, so those would be sort of three implications that show up. A final one that, that we're working on and relates to the trade question that I brought up is um, regional approaches to climate change are really likely to, to provide much greater uh, flexibility and, and options. Um, we showed you these, these big impacts on, on maize. Maize is the most important crop uh, in, the, in the region, but it's not happening uh, to all regions in Southern Africa at the same time. Those extreme events are occurring in different areas <laughs> and trading within Southern Africa in maize, but in other products as well, uh, provide sides of green progress really that had lies in the past uh, 20, 30 years in regional trade is something that's that's favorable to you know um, uh, confronting climate change. And it's it's something that that we should uh, we should continue. So those would be some some observations. Thank you, Mishuda. Thank, thanks very much, Channing. I'd like to introduce uh, our other panelists uh, this afternoon. We've got Salim Fakir. He's the executive director of the African Climate Foundation. Elias Masalela is the executive chairman of uh, DNA Economics. We've got Dr. Kanta Rigard. She is a lead environmental specialist at the Africa region at the World Bank. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So what I'd like to do to kick things off from our end is to get a view of how you saw this presentation, some of the views that you have on the presentation that Channing has presented to us or the synthesis that Channing presented a little earlier on. I think I'll start with Salim. Uh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to uh, have an uh, exchange with uh, Channing and the other uh, panelists here. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting uh, presentation, it would be good to get uh, into more detailed reports. But I'll make uh, two or three uh, observations uh, on his presentation, which um, sort of uh, triggered a, a number of thoughts, because uh, as African Climate Foundation, we have been engaging IFPRI uh, around the idea of thinking through uh, the agricultural space, particularly land use, sustainable agriculture. And I think that the, the shift in variability of weather patterns is, is a very important area for us to, to consider. We're also obviously very involved in uh, uh, energy transitions, particularly in South Africa, and we hope to roll out a, a big program uh, in, South, uh, in uh, the rest of Africa. And there's urban transitions work as well. And they're all intertwined. Um, I think the South African uh, you know, uh, work is interesting. I have uh, uh, questions about uh, the rest of the continent and, and what are the lessons uh, there. But I thought there were a couple of things that, um, uh, that uh, Channing brought to the table. Uh, 
we, we are obviously in, interested in uh, shifts in climate which affect weather. And the, the reason for that is that we, they have huge implications for the productivity of agriculture. And I think uh, Channing uh, alluded to that. Uh, but uh, the one area that I think the, the report uh, hasn't covered is the human dimension, effects of uh, thermal effects on uh, human labor. Uh, and particularly the, also the, the expansion of uh, the geographic zone of, of diseases, particularly the expansion of, of uh, malaria into warmer areas that once were, were, were colder and are becoming warmer will be subject to more uh, sort of uh, vector-borne diseases and the effects of that. And the third part is around, we've seen this with the uh, cyclones in Mozambique and so on, uh, the impact on critical infrastructure, particularly that's essential for exports of commodities, not only minerals, but agriculture, uh, especially in uh, uh, countries in Southern Africa that are highly dependent on agriculture for not only uh, labor intensity, but food security, and in some cases, exports uh, that have had a dramatic uh, uh, effect. And uh, I think what the presentation uh, raises, and it's a question I have for this group, the extent to which we must build uh, a approach to regional integration that takes into account uh, climate, that builds into the climate thinking, uh, particularly on its implications for agricultural economies, uh, how to distribute the burden of uh, vulnerability. Uh, uh, by doing that, we're also building resilience across uh, the region and in different parts of Africa. Some parts of the region are going to be more affected than others. And it's, it will be good to understand this a little bit more in granular terms, because it will influence the, the, the relationship between trade integration, which is starting to happen on the continent, uh, agricultural production, and the distribution of pr productive capacity in different parts of the continent. How we do that politically and economically is a, is a bigger question but it allows for a greater capability of resilience as a regional approach, because I don't think uh, these climate issues can be dealt with just on a national basis. It's very clear that there are regional dimensions to this. And I wanted to bring that into the conversation a lot more because it has a chance of being uh, missed if we just focused uh, merely on the national sphere. So I think agriculture is very crucial to take a more regional perspective, with it, if the climate lens is a stronger uh, uh, area of vulnerability, because in many African countries, whether vulnerable sectors, uh, which are vital to the economies of these countries, are likely to be impacted, uh, possibly negatively and positively by, by climate, but the assumption that we often make is that it's mostly negative. And uh, we have to find, uh, uh, three different approaches. Regional integration as a way of uh, for protecting uh, these sectors from, uh, in, uh, of, from uh, extreme weather. The second is to be able to uh, integrate uh, technology and infrastructure that can improve resilience of the sector. And the third, of course, is the finance and economic spin-offs of integration that allow for uh, more of these commodities to be traded internally within uh, the regional economies that can, uh, the, the, the important indirect effect of this improves income of farmers and also improves their resilient capability because it's definitely linked to income uh, and the national income uh, 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 sources can be improved uh, because the, what we are finding evidence of is that particularly poorer countries that are very uh, vulnerable to uh, extreme weather, can uh, and uh, can be uh, um, can can be driven into more debt trap, especially if they already have a debt uh, problem. Uh, so these are broader dimensions that uh, I think uh, we need to think about. I can talk about the other stuff later, but I want to give the other panelists an opportunity uh, to say something. Thanks. Thank you very much, Salim. You've brought a number of aspects to this conversation. So I think Elias would like to add a bit more on to that. You will just need to unmute your mic, Elias. We can't hear you. Thank you. 
This is training I never got at school, sorry. <laughs> I would like to start off by uh, echoing what Salim had said. I think it was a very good presentation. And the one thing that stands out to me in the presentation is how practical it is. What are the solutions that we should be thinking about now and in the future? But there are, there, there's a few other things that we need to also be thinking about. And the one that I would like to place right on the table, um, the, 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 the presentation talks about now or future in terms of what sort of investments we should be talking about. I think I want to take a slightly different approach to now or tomorrow and say, when we ask that question, are we asking it because we think the challenge is urgent or we think it can be delayed? And what we have found is that it is not a challenge that can be delayed. We're actually running behind the curve and I'm not sure if we're ever going to catch up with the curve. Um, add to that is that our region is one of the fastest warming regions. That means we need to take it more seriously than any other region in the world if we're going to be sustainable going forward. But as we do that, what is important is never leave other people behind. And for me, therein lies the importance of just transition. As we transition, what are the socioeconomic implications of so doing? And how do we make sure that we mitigate against the negative effects of what we're faced with? The big debate that we're have, having now, we've had in the planning commission for a very long time is coal or no coal. And it was very clear early in our years as South Africa when we negotiated the funding of uh, Midupi and the other, where when we went to the rest of the world, the first question that asked, they, they, they were asking South Africa is, why do you want to invest in coal? And the simple response was, what else? And it was clear that if you stop the use of coal immediately, South Africa is going to suffer and probably the rest of the continent is going to suffer. So the concept of, tran of, of transitioning in a sustainable and healthy way is extremely important. Salim also raised the issue of burden distribution. I would, I, would, I would like to also extend that slightly and ask the question, who is responsible for this transition? Who is supposed to fund it? And in a lot of debates, I have observed that people seem to think that it is government's responsibility. In fact, if you leave it to government, chances are we shall never transition. If we do transition, we'll transition in an erratic way. So there is a movement in South Africa called Impact Investing South Africa, which is a global movement driven by private sector players, owners of capital, who are saying the responsibility of sustainability ought to reside in the hands of the private sector, not in the hands of government. And they are willing to put money to deal with issues of the environment, issues of employment. And why is that so? It is so because in their minds, they are thinking about the problem in an intergenerational way. They would like to be in business in the current generation and also in the future generation. What they are also asking themselves is, what sort of world or what sort of economy do you want to bequeath to future generations, our children and our great grandchildren? And these, I think, are the questions that I would like to put on the table. And one of the things that um, ESA, Impact Investing South Africa, has done is work with the UNDP to do what they call an SDG map for South Africa and the continent. What what that does is identify the needs for capital and matching it with supply of capital to deal with sustainable issues. And 
working with the private with other party partners in the private sector not necessarily in impact investing they've come up with a concept of outcomes programs where you look at the appetite of the private sector where they would want to put their money get them to do what has been traditionally known as a government responsibility and get the private sector to invest their own capital upfront and depending on their performance you incentivize them accordingly in that way you move the debate from a talk stage into an implementation stage and I think this, this is what is interesting with the presentation that was presented today. It is very practical. It's asking the questions, what, what are the investments that we should be considering today and tomorrow? That's my input. Thank you very much, Elias. A number of uh, probing questions to the other panelists. So we've got a uh, Dr. Regard. Uh, she'll give uh, the last word on her thoughts on the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Masudu, and thank you to uh, Shannon and uh, my fellow panelists uh, for raising, I think, some very important questions and, and uh, obviously to the framing that Shannon had put out. I think it's always good to, good to start with, with the research and the science and the evidence and what that is telling us and how we need to really further embed that into our decision-making processes and uh, I think the messages from, from the presentation are, are clear. I think, you know, we, we, we get the reaffirmation on, on the critical importance of, of looking at the variability, looking at the climate trends, and, uh, you know, all shrouded in some level of uncertainty, but yet the need to act with certainty. And I think that's, that's where the dilemma comes in. And because it, Focus, focus a little bit on, on the agriculture area. So maybe just to continue that piece of the conversation. Um, I think to the point that uh, Salim made, I think it's correct. Uh, you know, the research just does say, you know, recent papers, I think published by Purdue and others, you know, do say that the impacts of, of climate on the crop side is really important, but even more important, particularly in the African context, is going to be the impact and exposure to the labor and to the people who are engaged in agriculture, especially in the lower latitudes. And this really then also throws into this partner the kind of food insecurity that could mount. Today, as we speak in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are about 220 million food insecure people and the numbers I believe went up in COVID. And when you put in the moderately food insecure, it becomes 600 million. And that really does mean something. And to Elliot's point about the intergenerational part where climate comes in is in a study that was done at the World Bank, it said that if in the first thousand days, a, a baby that is born doesn't get the right nutrition, they have intergenerational con consequences, especially girls, because it affects not just them, and their human capital development, but the next generation. So that means that the urgency for acting now is, is really high, even though we need to take some considerations into account. So, so what, what do we really have to do and, and how do we sort of address this issue, which is here and now, and which will have consequences across the board, right? And I think it's, it's no easy uh, answer to, you know, and I, I think, a uh, place in Africa, all of you uh, know that firsthand that it's really difficult, but we must act on it. But I think one important thing is how do we take that conversation bigger? I mean, it is about production on the farm, but food security, as I think Salim and others point, is much more. It's, it's something that it's about the access, it's about the distribution systems, and when we put out uh, the World Bank's Next Generation Africa Climate Business Plan, food security was a number one priority. And what we really said was that we needed to take an end-to-end -end approach uh, on, on food security. And climate affects every part of that end-to-end -end value chain. It affects things on the farm, as we saw in terms of productions and productivity patterns, but it also affects the distribution systems, 
even our roads and access systems can be and will be undermined by some of the climate side of it. And then I think in terms of food pricing, and that's where the trade question comes in and, and sort of how we look at things, perhaps from a regional context. So I think it's a very complex situation and I think climate cuts across the whole end to end. And that doesn't mean that we don't act on it. I think there, there is a need to act on it. Uh, to, to the point, I think I do believe that we need to continue to do the research, but we cannot postpone the action. And that's, I think, the reality uh, that we deal with, Mashudu. And I think there is clearly different challenges in different parts of, of the continent. Uh, and and uh, we can really have that conversation. There are financing gaps, there are technology gaps, there are uh, innovation gaps, and, and there's multiple things that we all need to do. Uh, but I think what we are also realizing is sometimes the solution is in the regional connectivity and looking at those issues. So there is ongoing work looking at food security in the Sahelian countries that brings a lot more regional partnerships together from research, uh, but also in terms of the practices and the access and distribution. But let me stop there. I think we can come back to more on this. Thank you very much, Dr. Rivard. Um, we do um, encourage our audience members to also be part of the conversation by writing their questions on the chat box and I can pose it to the panelists. I do have a question so far, it's from Rob Davies. He's asking Channing whether you have any insights on how climate related investments might interact with proposed post COVID infrastructure investments. Thank you. Oh, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And, and certainly what you, well, if we take the focusing on, on South Africa, um, this is this is the tricky problem, right? I mean, uh, very much South Africa wants to reemerge, emerge from the COVID uh, depression that the economy went into and, and, and still remains sort of deeply recessed. Um, and so, and and so, we we do want to come out of that um, as quickly as possible. At the same time, uh, there was a very poor growth performance leading into the the COVID recession, um, which so obviously some things need to be different, or we need to do we need to take the opportunity. Perhaps COVID creates some policy space in order to do things differently um, to to get growth. And so we're looking at the long run growth pattern. And when you're starting to look at, you know, moving towards this long run growth pattern, you want to um, deal with, with climate change. Uh, and, and there are sort of two sides to that. Uh, you know, Elias was, was focusing, uh, mentioning the mitigation challenges and, uh, you know, transitioning. And it's, it's definitely true that, that, you know, you can't just throw away your, your coal fired power fleet uh, tomorrow, that that's not going to work. You have to have a transition and a, and a transition um, plan. Um, the same goes with um, the, the regional dimensions and some of the things that, that you'll want to do. And, and you, so you have a, a, a difficult challenge. You, know, you want to carefully balance investments that are going to quickly pay so you can get your economy growing again. And at the same time, be looking forward to these, to these longer term challenges that, um, that, that COVID, uh, well, that, that climate change is going, going, to, going to pose. Um, so, you know, returning to kind of the, the um, extreme events uh, example, and this applies in South Africa as, as, as well as, as everywhere else. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that South Africa is already doing is, is looking at higher temperatures and, and what that means for transport infrastructure and transport investments. Uh, it means, you know, in an engineering sense, a different pavement mix um, to, you know, deal with, with the higher temperatures. And that's something that, that you, I mean, that almost free. Uh, you, you just need to think of it as you are rehabilitating your your roads, or and if you're building new roads, you notice on the on the distributions that we were showing, you could get less rain, but you could also get more, and you can also get pulses of rain. Uh, so you know, flooding becomes an issue, and in you know, in particular areas, we know where they are. Uh, you know, flooding is much more likely on a plain somewhere than it is you know on some on some hill. Uh, so you, you need to uh, uh, think about that as you're investing uh, and either 
perhaps place roads uh, on slightly higher ground, um, build um, uh, you know bigger pipes uh, to, to transport water underneath the roads. Uh, these kinds of things are, are the things that that one can take on, you know, now as you are investing, such that you have a more resilient uh, set of of infrastructure, and you are providing the infrastructure that you need to 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 stimulate growth in in the in the short run. So, uh, can, thanks for that question. Can I ride on that question? So, oh, you can do that. Yeah, the rider for me is doing a comparison between the impact of COVID and the impact of the environmental tra transformation we're going through um, as human beings. People have responded very quickly to COVID because it has direct and immediate negative effects on the human being. How do we put the same level of attention on environmental changes? Channing can answer to this. It can be answered by any of the panelists. I'll, I'll let somebody else jump in. Uh, can I um, just pick up on uh, what Elias and Channing said, in, 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 um, with regard to, to Rob's comment about the nature of investments? Of course, um, uh, the, the, the basic things that uh, agriculture and I, I want to talk uh, particularly in South Africa and, and beyond South Africa, uh, as we see it is that the, the basic infrastructure of agriculture, I mean, research, um, uh, farmer extension support, uh, integration of uh, agriculture into uh, this specific value chain, um, researching new types of crops, uh, introducing uh, crops that are more uh, uh, resistant to disease and, and extreme weather conditions. Those basic things have to be done in order to improve the climate resilient component of it. Uh, so we are also on a back foot uh, in terms of the development of the agricultural sector and the rate of investment on the continent. In fact, uh, if you look at the AU uh, Comprehensive Agricultural Development Program, I think it recommends 10% or 15% of GDP, I can't remember the exact figure, but none of the countries in Africa are at that level. So that's the, the first thing. There's a big debate to be had uh, in terms of uh, the role of the state. And in many cases, the state doesn't have the capacity and uh, the, the necessary resources because its fiscal space is very narrow. Uh, then, then the question arises about how does one work with private uh, uh, financiers, I think Elias was talking about impact investment um, in a range of areas around genetics, land use uh, practices, technology, uh, weatherproofing uh, certain types of agricultural practices. Private firms in South Africa are already doing uh, cover farming, which is an extensive, uh, expensive infrastructure. Um, and then improving infrastructure and logistics. Uh, Lots of agricultural uh, income and uh, diversity can be improved with more investments in irrigation, uh, energy, and road, road, uh, uh, road networks, which uh, in many countries uh, are very poorly serviced. Uh, we have a situation in South Africa, for example, the milk industry uh, suffering from massive uh, poor road infrastructure, particularly in the Eastern Cape, that they can't supply uh, milk, uh, uh, it, timely to um, a specific um, uh, 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 in terms of supplying to, to the necessary places uh, because of the poor road infrastructure in some of the, the rural areas. So some of these basic things have to be really looked at uh, before you can actually even embark on a more advanced scale of uh, accommodating uh, shifts in weather pattern and climate uh, to build a more resilient agricultural economy. And uh, I think it's important to consider the nexus in particularly the rest of the continent, uh, improvements in, in energy and agriculture, because that also allows for diversification of uh, agricultural production uh, beyond just narrow um, crop, 
cultivation to uh, processing and other types of uh, um, uh, uh, diversified income sources within a rural farm state or rural context. Thanks. Thank you very much, Salim. We've got a question from Shingi Dube. Um, her question begins with, with the South Africa currently lagging in key infrastructure investments such as water infrastructure, to what extent do you think government will respond to the needs of climate change as a present and pressing issue to shift resources and start investing in water and infrastructure? I'm not sure if you'd like to take that one, Chani. Sure. Was Kenneth the stress pack on the line? If you'd like to also respond to anything, he's more than welcome to do so. Okay. So um, one of the uh, one of the one of the assets that South Africa has is a is a very good water infrastructure uh, already. Uh, so it's it's important. It's obviously it can always be better, and and there are are things to do. But uh, it's it's really a maintenance question, and making sure that 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 infrastructure stays in place, and then looking for selected areas to to improve that. Um, I think that that's a point that that's been made, uh, and and that should come into consideration very much, uh, you know, as we head out of the the pandemic. I think um, <laughs> the other you know another burning question in South Africa with climate. Uh, comes in quite strongly is the land reform issue. Uh, this is obviously a big uh, issue for, for South Africa. Um, what we tend to find is that uh, you know South African agriculture, small farmers, uh, very strongly tend to irrigate. So they they tend to put some water on the on those crops. They're not uh, working in in a purely dry land uh, situation. And after having looked at the issue for a little while, I've, I've concluded that you know we we've almost misnamed it. It's uh, it's not so much land reform, or it's at least as much water reform as it is as it is land reform. Uh, in terms of making sure that uh, these smaller plots, if they're going to be more intensively cultivated, um, have access to to water, and and water is going to is already in short supply. So this this is a that that's an important uh, a really important issue for for making that uh, important program uh, successful. Uh, and 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 there's a there's an infrastructure need there. Uh, and when you're starting to reform water, um, you know the, the upsides go up and the downsides go go up as well. If you you know if you start to take really productive water and putting it to unproductive uses, you can have a, a, a real downside as as well. So this is this is a, a really important part of, of where uh, investment and uh, you know where where South Africa wants to go and and how it it should. It should do it. So the the, the water infrastructure issue uh, relates to municipal and industrial the ability to to handle you know in say Hauteng, um, you know be able to have the municipal the, you know basically you need to be able to flush your toilet and so forth um, in 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 those areas uh, and and being you know, having that supply and then relating right into you know the big users which which are which are agriculture. Ken, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? And then I think Elias has a point. Can I come in on that uh, to add to what Channing said? Sorry. Sure. Sure. Please, yeah. can't. sure. No, I just wanted to add, I think, on the water side and to what uh, Channing just said. I think clearly, I think uh, maintaining and, and, and working on the infrastructure side is important. Uh, but in terms of the land, I was thinking uh, it's also critically important uh, that we kind of blend the, the gray infrastructure with the green and make sure that we have those, uh, you know, natural systems conserved in terms of regulating the floods and the soil erosion and, and sort of the water conservation measures. Because I think in, as you have that increasing variability, the critical importance of these natural ecosystems is really important. And in some ways, they, they also become the first line of defense against the kind of variability and extremes that, uh, that climate change will bring with it. Uh, but clearly, of course, these systems also have many other benefits to communities and livelihoods. Uh, and and, and in the African context, I think, you know, the sort of ecosystem stability and, and how we sort of recognize the critical importance of natural capital within the sort of whole accounting of how we look at infrastructure 
uh, really is something that's also been missed in some of the sort of cost benefit analysis, if you want to call it. Uh, and, but I think that their value uh, is even more enhanced uh, with, in the context of climate change. And, and if that can be brought into the accounting processes, I think that would be really important. Uh, thank you. The only thing I, I was going to add to, to those good comments is what we're seeing is clearly a increased demand by, by crops, rain fed and um, irrigated for water. So even if water um, does go up, we're seeing that that's being taken up by more thirsty agriculture. So the climate will put a big stress on, on agriculture. We're also seeing by about 2050, 2070 with a growing economy, a, a big uh, clash between uh, use of water in industry against agriculture. The other thing that South Africa has to look at is regional solutions, both from water. There are people looking as far as the Congo Basin to bring water down. They're, they're looking at Zambezi, they're looking at others to bring water long distances to, to South Africa. And so those are in people's minds, but also regional solutions to where food would be grown. So food security rather than food self-sufficiency. And that's really important for protecting the environment. So um, the message to South Africa is we need to look in the regional context of SADC and in the region for solving these problems because there'll be differential impacts, but also it will lessen the, the blow on, on any one country. Thank you very much, Kenneth. We've got a question from Tim Thomas. He wants to challenge the panel to go beyond recognizing the huge need for investment in climate resilience to address the budget constraints and hence a prioritization of investment. So his question is, what are the priority investments right now? What are the investments that are better postponed until uncertainty of climate is better resolved? Happy to start only, off. Okay. Oh, sorry, go cut it, please. Go. That's fine. I'm happy to start off because I think that's a, a really important uh, and a really good question because that is the crux of the issue. Uh, because we want to really, uh, you know, look at the infrastructure needs and gaps that exist uh, in, in the continent. And then I think, of course, there is the climate uh, resilient infrastructure that is a reality that we have to embed into that decision making process. So if we look at the infrastructure needs uh, for, for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's in the tune of $150 billion. If we look at the infrastructure gap, it's close to 60 to 100 billion dollars. Uh, and, and when we begin to think about infrastructure, I think we really think it's not just about the physical assets. It's really about what infrastructure means for livelihoods, what it means for having schools and hospitals and, and, and sort of the ability to, to, to have the economic growth. And in, in, some, in some ways that cannot be postponed. And, uh, but clearly it also still needs a prioritization because there is a, a financing gap, leave alone the fact that you want to make it resilient, but uh, in the context of making it resilient, I mean, there, there is research that shows that in fact, uh, making it resilient can have cost savings. There was a Lifelines report uh, that the World Bank put out about 18 months ago and recognize that, that you know, for every dollar invested, the returns were $4 for making it climate resilient. And that you know, in the low and middle income countries, you could have you know, benefits that go up to $4.2 trillion over time, over the lifetime of the assets. So what is really the challenge is the, the budget gap that exists right now as, as the person who posed the question. And that I think is, is where countries are struggling with because they have numerous needs and that capacity, that budgets to do that is lacking. Where I think that, that the climate resilience comes in is how can we bring the best, the knowledge, the best research and the best ways in which we can make sure that investments that are designed now uh, build into them some of the climate considerations, notwithstanding the, the future uncertainties but put in place the regulations, put in place the policies and incentives, uh, whether with the public or private sector, to make sure that we can uh, not be locked into options that are worse. 
So the bottom line is, I think there is a real financing gap and some of these aspects that need to bring in the resilience, I think that we should find ways in which hopefully the international community can come in to help to support some of that, uh, to complement the budgets and the, sometimes the limited budgets uh, that government ha governments have. Uh, but I, I really like the question because I think it's, it's really sp spot on the issue that's on the table and that there is an infrastructure gap and a deficit. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, the question raised by Tim is, is sort of um, uh, more or less the, the points I was trying to raise earlier, that um, the pathway to climate resilience is actually to improve the, the picture and the dynamism and the uh, economic viability of agriculture on the continent. If you don't get that right, I, there's no point in talking about climate resilience. Uh, I'm, I'll even say that as a a person who runs a climate foundation, because they, these two notions are not inseparable. They actually have to be uh, tagged together. Uh, but the, the one is very dependent on the outcome of the other. So limited investments in agriculture in general uh, are, are not uh, really conducive, uh, neither for economic growth, nor for development, uh, job creation, nor for, nor for climate resilience. So that entire picture has to be built around what the economic, uh, 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 how to enhance the economic uh, dynamism of agriculture. Uh, and there are lots of things that go into that. We've talked about some of them, infrastructure, there are many other aspects to it. Uh, and it's, it's very clear that agricultural potential on the continent is huge. It's underserviced, it's underexploited. Uh, we just have to look at figures around in terms of percentage of irrigation uh, infrastructure compared to Asia. And then there's a big trade dimension to this, uh, which has to be positive, uh, both within the region and external partners outside of the region that can support the upliftment of agricultural development, uh, which in my, my view is, is very important for climate resilience. Uh, trying to talk about climate resilience without a proper notion of what agri uh, how, how agricultural economies and development have, uh, have to be uh, developed uh, is uh, only talking to one half of the issue. So I don't want us to also be distracted by the notion of climate resilience as if it's some uh, in a separate picture to the world of agriculture. They have to actually be tagged together uh, and uh, budgeting and financing of of agriculture in the future will have to take climate issues into account. It's just uh, an intrinsic part of the investment uh, models that will have to be developed. Uh, it can't be separated from it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Salim. I think Elias would like to, to also respond to this question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. I would also want to go back to water as well. Um, this, this is a very broad question and very difficult to answer. It's almost trying to answer the question, what is impact investing? In the impact investing movement, we've said impact investing is what you think has the impact you want it to have. And this is for one simple reason. Each circumstance is different. And the way in which you invest also matters. So if one would try to answer a question as broad as this one, I would say the best investments to deal with today are what I call investments that COVID-proof your business or that COVID-proof your economy. Investments that climate-proof your business or climate-proof your economy. And you have a wide range there to pick from depending on what your capacity or your skills are to help in society. So it, it is very difficult to answer that question. I have asked a number of asset managers in South Africa, and every time I ask this question or two questions, I get a blank response. The first question that I've asked is, how many of you in this room have invested in finding a solution to the COVID pandemic, supporting the research that's taking place. 
And in most instances, it's zero. Secondly, I've said, how many of you in this room can survive without ESCOM? And you can imagine what the answer is. Then I ask a further question. Would you be willing to put more money into ESCOM to sort it out? And you can imagine what the response is. So I'm using these examples as illustrations for how complex the question is, but it's a very pertinent question and it depends on who is answering it and what do they want to achieve. Then I would like to go back to the issue of water. I think that was a very good question to ask because water has been identified as one of the biggest bottlenecks for South Africa in the National Development Plan. But what the plan also identifies is that it is not so much that we have underinvested in water. We've invested badly. After having invested badly, we've managed water badly. Despite the fact that we say we are a water constrained economy, the way in which we manage our water is not reflective of that. The way in which we behave both at the policy level and at the consumption level does not reflect the state of the economy. Just to give you an astounding statistic, uh, which I always grapple with, and I never know how to um, assimilate it and accept it as a statistic that I can live with. Out of the allocated water, 60% of it goes to agriculture. But if you look at the contribution of agriculture to the economy, it tells you that there's something wrong. If you look at the productivity of, of agriculture relative to other economies, and the one economy that I always look at and I ask myself, why should we be importing agricultural commodities from that country is Israel. I think we have better conditions than Israel, but in agriculture, they seem to be performing better than us. Whether it's technology, definitely cannot be water, but from, our, from my perspective, if we were managing water properly, I think our agriculture, if, assuming you, you already in, invest properly in, in, in research and technology in that area, agriculture should be one of the driving forces in South Africa going forward. But it is not the case. So management for me is key. And I'm using water as an illustration the challenge of management seems to happen across all sectors. And that's, that's how we should be thinking about how we manage resources, how we invest, and how we foolproof ourselves from other vagaries that are going to come. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much, Elias. We have another question, and I think this question would, um, would be best answered by you, but uh, other panelists are more than welcome to respond to this question. It's from M. Thatcher. Uh, he says, or she says, how can we ensure that the private sector responsibly invest in sustainable agriculture and energy, considering the impact that speculative investments in agricultural commodities had on food prices in 2008 and the general prioritization of shareholder profits? How can we ensure that the private sector will prioritize long-term sustainability over short-term profits. It's very difficult to represent business. I think it's more difficult to represent government. Um, I, I think we cannot run away from the fact that private sector is in business for profit. But what we're also beginning to see is that private sector is quickly appreciating that if they want to stay profitable, they need to think long-term. They need to be sustainable. Those private sector players that are doing it for profit maximization at all costs, the likelihood is that they will not survive. 
It is the wider, the wiser ones, the ones that understand the value of taking a long-term view that are going to stay in business. Unfortunately, as we as we were trying to turn around the, 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 the future of agriculture, you find that there are other variables that come into play. The water issue cannot be ignored. The land issue cannot be ignored. So for a lot of people playing in agriculture, particularly those who feel at risk, the likelihood is until the land issue is resolved, they are not going to take a long-term view. They'll always take a short-term view. And how do you blame them where there's no, where there's no certainty? So one of the biggest uh, recommendations that have come out of the National Planning Commission is that we need to provide policy certainty to the market for us to see the behavior that we want to see. If we don't do that, the likelihood is private sector is going to continue behaving in a short termism manner. Now, when, when we moved to a multi-year budget in 1998, 99, whenever that was, there are people on the call who will remind us, it was to provide more certainty. When we introduce the plan, which gives us a, a, a line of sight to 2030, was to further enhance certainty. But I don't think that we have complemented those two uh, in tactical interventions in the way in which we do and communicate to, to the markets. I'm not sure if it helps the, 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 the person who asked the question. Maybe, sorry. You, you want I, just to add? Wanted, I just wanted to add to on the private sector question. I, I have no comparative advantage, but I perhaps it's as much a question as an answer. I think that uh, private sector is, is a very big, uh, you know, composite set of, of actors and players. And clearly you do have the, the slice that is um, the one that has to operate on a profit model. Uh, but you also have private sector that I would like to call the enablers uh, for the sort of uh, climate uh, resilience or climate context. And these are the emerging companies that are really able to provide you with the innovation, the tool, the technology uh, that better allows you to embed your climate considerations. I'm thinking here about some of these emerging um, businesses around those who use satellite data to provide you timely information to, to look at how you can uh, really use that information to get some kind of early warning system going, translating the geospatial data into a vegetation index that tells you that drought is coming up or using other data sets to, to drive certain innovation and technology uh, or coming up with you know, equipment in, in, in sort of uh, farms that is more climate friendly or businesses that are along the green line that are tapping into uh, people who are willing to pay that extra because they are sort of environmentally or climately conscious. So I think we need to bring in that aspect of the private sector, who is also perhaps operating on a profit model, but who are also along the way enhancing the climate resilience or low carbon uh, technologies uh, through their work. So just, you know, as much a question as an answer, but I do think that there is an emerging uh, set of businesses around this who still need to be sort of propped up with some incentives, but I think they will be an important player moving forward. Thank you. M. Thatcher is very happy with the responses that he has received this afternoon. Thank you very much for that question, M. Thatcher. It, we have come to the end of our conversation. I can't believe that we are at the end. It's been so insightful. Thank you very much to all the speakers and panelists this afternoon. I'll start off by Channing Art, the Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at AFPRI and uh, Kenneth Stresspack from MIT. Our guest, Salim Fakir, is the di Executive Director at the African Climate Foundation, Elias Masilela, the executive chairman of DNA Economics and Dr. Kanta Rigard, a lead environmental specialist at Africa Region at the World Bank. And a big thank you to you, our audience, for being part of the conversation this afternoon. 
And a very big thank you also goes out to, to our officials partners without whom this would have been possible, not have been possible. UNU wider, the National Treasury, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Institute, and most of all, the European Union for their com continued commitment and invaluable financial support for this very important program. Before I continue, I see Arndt um, Channing has got his hand up before I conclude. Um, did you want to add a few words? Jenny? I do. Thank you very much, Ms. Shudu. First, I want to very much thank the, the panelists for, for joining us. They volunteered their time and, and really thank them for, for their expertise. The other thing that I wanted to do was just recognize that one of South Africa's preeminent climate change experts, Bob Scholes, passed away a couple of weeks ago, and I just wanted to, to pay respects. Uh, he was present at a workshop uh, that, that we ran on climate change, actually, issues uh, seven or eight uh, years ago in an earlier version of this, of this program. So I, I just thought it would be useful to, to, to pay those respects before we concluded. Thank you, Mishuba. Thank you very much. May his soul rest in peace. And a uh, thank, big thank you once again to our audience members for joining us this afternoon. And do look out for the next Policy Dialogue, which will be on the 28th of May on international trade and global value change. So don't also forget to visit uh, the SA Tide website for more research that's been done under the six work streams. Have a lovely afternoon further. Thank you very much. Can go back.